Namaha ho 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 Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Makte Bhakti Vedanta Swamin Naiti Namine Gadadada Shiva Sari Krishna Hare 
Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare. Krishna, Evil. Hey, Rama Rama Hari, Jaya Pancha Tadva, Pancha Tadva, Pancha Tadva, Jaya Pancha Tadva. Jaya Ghorani Thai, Ghorani Thai, Ghorani Thai, Jaya Ghorani Thai. And here Thai Ghor Hari Bhong, Hari Bhong, Hari Bhong, Ghor Hari Bhong. Thai Gauda Bhimanande Jaya Jaya Prabhu Phan Prabhu Phan Prabhu Phan Jaya Prabhu Phan Prabhu Phan Jaya 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 Prabhu Phan Prabhu Phan Prabhu Pan, Jai Prabhu Pan. Shil Prabhu Pan ki, Jai Gaur Pemanande. Shil Prabhu Pan ki, Jai Hari Nam Sankirtan ki, Jai. Hare Krishna Mahamantra ki, Jai. So this uh, is the second in the four days of speaking it's exclusively on Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And today we'll cover the uh, fundamental reasons for the appearance of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, which are mentioned here in the Chaitanya Charitamrita chapter 4, Vadi Lila the confidential reasons for the Lord's appearance. And this is verse 36 and 37. Evanchya yacha krishna prakarta karana asura samhara sangu anusanga prayojana. We'll try a different melody. Evanchya yacha krishna prakritya karana asura samhara asunga prayojana. Try it. Hey, <laughs> Matta Chaitanya Krishna, Purna Bhagavan, Yuga Dharma Pavartana, Nahitara Kam. Evanchya Yatche Krishna Prakritya Karana Asura Samhara Asangaya Prayojana Emata Chaitanya Krishna Purna Bhagavan Yuga Dharma Pavartana Nahitara Kam Very good. Okay. A. This. Vancha. Desire. Yache. Just as. Krishna. Of Lord Krishna. Prakritya. For the manifestation. Karana. Reason. Asura Samhara. The killing of demons. Anu Sangha, secondary, Prayojana, 
reason. A mata, like this, Chaitanya, as Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Krishna, Lord Krishna. Purna, full. Bhagavan, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Yuga Dharma, the religion of the age. Far par Parvatana, initiating. Nahe, is not. Tanra, of him. Kama, the desire. Translation, just as these desires are fundamental reasons for Krishna's appearance, whereas destroying the demons is only incidental, necessary, necessity, so for Sri Krishna Chaitanya, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, promulgated the Dharma of the age, is incidental. So I'll read it again. Just as these desires are the fundamental reason for Krishna's appearance, whereas destroying the demons is only an incidental necessity, so for Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, promulgating the Dharma of the age is incidental. So what is the Dharma of the age? Chanting the hard Lord's name, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So Krishna says in the Gita that he comes to annihilate the demons, reestablish religion. But that's, as it says, incidental means secondary. Initially he comes to uh, give his association to the devotees. That picture that you have there, it shouldn't be directly onto the floor. There should be a, put a cushion underneath it. These, yeah, they should always be off the floor. Okay, good. And so for Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, um, bringing the Yuga Dharma is secondary. So sometimes we think he came specifically for that. But that's the secondary reason. The initial reason will be explained now. <laughs> um, next verse. When the Lord desired to appear for another reason, the time for promulgating the religion of the age also arose. So it's coincidental, it appears to be, that there was another reason the Lord came, and it just happened to be the time for bringing the Yuga Dharma. So you might say it's kind of coincidental or just arranged that way. Next verse, 39. Thus, with two intentions, the Lord appeared with his devotees and tasted the nectar of prema with the congregational chanting of the holy name. Thus, he spread kirtan even among the untouchables. He wore a wreath of the holy name and and Prema, which he engarlanded the entire world. Mm -hmm. So, I, so the and the reasons why the Lord came is mentioned earlier in the same chapter. And so we'll discuss those six reasons why the Lord came. Omagyan timirandasya gena jana salakaya chakshu unmilitam yena tas mai shi guru gena maha shi chaitanya mano bistam stapti som yena bhutale swayam rupa kadam mayam tadanti swam padanti kam vande ham shi guru shi yuta padikamalam shi gurun vaishnavam scha Sri Rupam Sagajigitam Sahaganat Raganatam Bitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Sarvadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padam Sahaganat Lalita Sri Vishakam Bitam Scha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Sri Bhakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pacharine 
nirvisesa sunyavadi pasyatya de sitarine. Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Hadvaita Gadad Har Srivasati Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare hmm. So there's a very long purport in verse number 41 which describes the mood of the Lord's appearance but we'll mention that in the form of a story, which is a pastime that is mentioned in um, Chaitanya Mangala. Chaitanya Mangala is one of the three authorized biographies of uh, Lord Chaitanya's life, its teachings. It's the shortest of the three. The most lengthy is Chaitanya Bhagwat by Vrindavan Das Thakur. Vrindavan Das Thakur was born from Srivas Thakur's niece, whose name was Narayani. So Srivas Thakur had a brother, um, Nila Kanta, I think his name was, and he had a daughter named Narayani. And one day Lord Chaitanya gave his remnants to little Narayani. She was four years old at the time. And he said to her, Narayani, chant Hare Krishna. And she chanted Hare Krishna and she fainted in ecstasy, four years old. <laughs> so that same Narayani, being blessed directly by Lord Chaitanya, gave birth to the father of the teachings of Lord Chaitanya, which was uh, Vrindavan Das Thakur. So his biography is accepted as the most authorized and the most lengthy then we have Chaitanya Charitamrita by Krishna Das Gavi Raj Goswami, which Srila Prabhupada chose for our society to be the biography of the Lord. The reason why he chose that over Chaitanya Bhagavat is because for two reasons. One, Chaitanya Bhagavat emphasizes emphasizes more Lord Nityananda than he does Lord Chaitanya. But that's not the main reason, the main reason is that in Chaitanya Chari Timrita, there are a lot of scriptural references, especially coming from Srimad Bhagavatam, where in Vrindavadas Thakur's Chaitanya Bhagavat, it's mostly all Leela. So Chaitanya Chari Timrita is a, a more of a balanced combination between Tattva, philosophy, and Leela, whereas Chaitanya Bhagavat is mostly Leela, what a little tattva. Chaitanya Mangala is mostly just Leela. So in that narration, there is a description where Narada Muni is speaking, I believe, to King Yudhisthira or someone. I can't remember who the personality is. And he's describing what happened in Dwarka when Krishna was there with his principal queen. Yep. Krishna has one... 16,108 queens. And the principal queen is Rukmini Devi. She is an expansion of the gopi Chandravali, who is one of the principal, second principal gopi in Vrindavan. The principal gopi we know is Srimati Radharani. So Radharani reappeared as Satyabhama, as one of the queens, and because Krishna was in a different mood when he was in Dwarka, his principal queen became his secondary queen, secondary energy, which was from the Vrindavan, which was Chandravali, and she became Rukmini. So Rukmini was the prime queen of Lord Krishna, who was Dwarka Dish in the mood of opulence. So one day, this is thrived that she's massaging his feet very nicely. And she's feeling, Krishna's feet, she's feeling ecstasy in that service. And her emotions are becoming very strong. And she can't re hold back her feelings. So she starts to express that feelings in a loving way by saying, my dear Lord, you don't know how wonderful you are. <laughs> Very well. My dear Lord, you don't know how wonderful you are. 
And she says, and your lotus feet are the most wonderful. <laughs> While she's massaging him. And she's saying this over and over again. And finally, I mean, Krishna's listening. And finally she says, but there is one person who does know. You don't even know how wonderful you are. That's how wonderful you are. <laughs> There's a story where Krishna walks. He's walking and he passes this large reflecting pillar. It's a pillar, but it's got a mirror-like image to it. And when Krishna walks past, he says, wow, who's that? And then he looks, oh, that's me. <laughs> So Krishna gets attracted by himself. <laughs> we shouldn't try that. <laughs> but Krishna can do that because he's all attractive. <laughs> uh, but he's because he's humble, he doesn't he sometimes he gets attracted by himself and he doesn't even know it. <laughs> but that attractive potency of him is so strong that even he's not fully aware of it, but there's one person who is. And then Krishna inquires, well, who is that person? And then Rukmini says, it's only Srimati Radharani. Only she knows how wonderful you are. So now Krishna's thinking, hmm, I'm so wonderful, and I don't know how, how wonderful I am, but there is a person who does know how wonderful I am, and I want to find out more about me <laughs> from taking her position. So that is the actual leela that led up to the appearance of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Of course, it's an eternal leela, it's nitya leela. But for the sake of understanding, it's explained within a, an incident. And the Lord, therefore, came as Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He's Sri Krishna Chaitanya Radha Krishna Nohi Anya. He is Krishna, but he has her mood. He, she is Gorangi, and he is Goranga. She is golden-limbed, and he is golden-limbed also. And he has her bhakti, which is the highest form of expression for love for himself. And that is the mood of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's appearance, and that is the prime reason why the Lord appears. As mentioned here, the secondary reason, or the incidental reason, is to initiate the Yuga Dharma. So that happened, just happened to be around the same time. But the Lord wanted to taste that sweetness and appear, and that sweetness is manifested in three aspects of itself. One, what is her love for me? What's the nature of that love? Two, what is the happiness that she feels in that love? Three, and what is it about me that's so attractive to her? So these are the three internal reasons. What is the nature of her love? What is it about me that is so attractive to her? And what is the happiness that she feels in that love? So that's Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. That's his mood of devotion. So we worship Lord Chaitanya as Krishna, but with knowing that his mood is devotion to himself in the form of Radharani's bhakti. And of course, then, then there's the external reasons. The external reasons apparently is the one why he appeared in this world, and we more give more emphasis on that, but that's actually, as it says, incidental. And what was the three external reasons? Well, during the time of when Sri Advaita, was there just before the appearance of Lord Chaitanya. Sri Advaita appeared 52 years before Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He was 52 years old. He lived to about 127 years, I think. He was 127 years when he left the planet. So he was still there even when Lord Chaitanya came and gone. Now he, you know, who is Advaita Acharya? He's Mahavishnu, but he has the mood of Lord Shiva. And what is Lord Shiva? Lord Shiva is the compassionate manifestation of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Shiva is so kind that he's always trying to help the conditioned souls to become God conscious. 
and that's his mood of service. So in that mood of Advaita Charya, when he was seeing what was happening in the world around, that people were practicing various kinds of religious practices, but not real bhakti. They were worshiping demigods. They were worshiping various types of deities simply to gain some material benefit. It's mentioned in the Shastras that people worship God in order to improve their material situation. But that is not the reason. If someone is worshiping God to improve their material situation, it's not so bad, but it's not perfection. <laughs> They'll get a little bit of God consciousness, but they're mostly interested in making a nice arrangement in this world. So they'll have to take another birth in a better position next life and again to continue. <laughs> But because it's centered around God, it's considered to be pious and acceptable. But those who know the real principles of religion find that that is simply a diversion from the goal of life, which is to love God, Prema Pumartam Maham, without any personal desire for any material gain. <laughs> so, um, Advaita Chari is seeing how people what were they doing? They were worshipping demigods. They would make images of the demigods, offer prayers to the demigods, perform various worship of the demigods, and then after some time they would take the deity and throw it in the river. <laughs> and this was going on regularly just so they can increase their material prosperity. And Navadweep was quite opulent at the time. People were quite pros prosperous. And people were quite intelligent. They were pious. They were religious, but they weren't not. They weren't hardly any devotees. So Advaita Charya was seeing that, and he was becoming unhappy. He is the supreme personality of Godhead, Sri Mahavishnu. But in the mood of Lord Shiva, he wanted to do something to help the conditioned souls. So he started to pray to the Lord. He said, "My dear Lord, please." I cannot make a difference. Only you can do it. So please, you come in your personal form and bring about a change in the atmosphere. Bring the Yuga Dharma, bring the chanting of the holy names of Krishna to the world. And then what he did in order to fulfill that desire, he seriously engaged in puja to the Lord. Every day, Twice a day, he would go down to the banks of the Ganga. He would make a Shiva Linga. And with Ganges waters, Tulsi leaves, and sandalwood pep, he would worship that Linga and flowers. And he would throw the offerings into the Ganges as an offering to the Ganges. And he would call the Lord loudly. They said the loud calling of Advaita Acharya. The Lord said, he woke me up and I came. <laughs> he was calling from really loud because he wanted the Lord to come. So that is mentioned as one of the prime external reasons for the Lord's appearance in the world. To bring about the change in the atmosphere to bhakti. Uh, the secondary reason we all know, is that he wanted to come to, in order to propagate the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Sometimes we think that's the primary reason, but it's not. It's secondary. But we all benefit by that. <laughs> that's our good fortune. And the third reason is, as Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, yada yada hi dharmasya, glanir bhavati bharata abhutanam adharmasya tadatmanam srijamiyaham pravitranaya sadunam Vinasanaya chaduskritam dharma samstar panartayam sambhavami yuge yuge. So Krishna speaks that, and that is the other reason to uh, relieve ir irreligion from the world, to give association to his devotees, and to re establish religious principles. So these are the three external reasons, and then we mentioned the three internal reasons. 
So the sum total of these six reasons brought Lord Chaitanya's appearance into the world like that. So for our perspective, this Yuga Dharma is what the world is benefiting from. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu emphasized the Yuga Dharma only in his later pastimes. During the last six years of his life, did he, he really go into the mood of his internal reasons, where he was in the mood of more or less seclusion in Gambira, in Jagannath Puri, and he would hear regularly the prayers of Chandidas, Vyapati, uh, Jayadev Goswami, the deep feelings of Radharani's love for Krishna, and then he would go into trance and ecstasy. And he did that for six years. And during those six years, he wrote that one treatise that we all familiar with, Sri Shikshastakam prayers, which is the basis for our understanding of the entire process of pure devotional service. So it's the devotees are recommended every day, especially before you begin your rounds of japa, to read those prayers, go deeper into the prayers. In most of our temples around the world, probably all of the temples, during the morning program, I know here also, uh, we recite those shikshastakam prayers because they will awaken a type of devotion which will inspire the chanting of the holy name of the Lord. Because those prayers are none different than the holy name. In fact, Bhakti Vinod Thakur says, Hare Krishna is the first verse. Hare Krishna is the second verse. Krishna Krishna is the third verse. Hare Hare is the fourth verse. Hare Rama is the fifth verse. Hare Rama is the sixth verse. Rama Rama is the seventh verse. Hari Hari is the eighth verse. So those eight prayers actually are none different than the chanting of the holy names of the Lord. That's how powerful they are. And as Srila Prabhupada mentions, the six Goswamis of Vrindavan, the authorized followers of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu wrote all of their books. And they wrote hundreds of books. Jiva Goswami wrote 400,000 verses, just him alone. What to speak of Rupa Goswami, Sanatan Goswami, and Raghunath Das Goswami. Uh, those particular Goswamis, yeah, those f five Goswamis, Gopal Bhatta Goswami also wrote something. Gopal, uh, what was it? Raghunath Bhatta Goswami didn't write hardly anything that we know of. But out of those four main Goswamis, they wrote thousands, hundreds of thousands of verses, all based on the teachings of Shikshastik and prayers. So that, that is the concentrated form of transcendental pure devotional service, those eight verses. If you can study them and understand them deeper, you'll understand the whole process of devotional service. We have, in order to, for me to explain it more, We'd have to go by verse by verse, but it's so it's such a beautiful, beautiful explanation, explanation of prema bhakti, ultimately as the goal of devotional service, and it's Lord Chaitanya's ecstasy and love of God. He wrote that in a, in a state of ecstasy. It wasn't that he wrote it and he just sat down like we sit down and we want to write something, so we got some ideas and we write. He was in ecstasy and he wrote those eight verses. <laughs> And so those ecstasies are actually, you know, the highest form of transcendental knowledge. <laughs> and so the appearance of the Lord for the first 42 years of his life mostly centered around enchanting of the holy name. At least for the from the age of from the age of 18 to the age of 30, 42, mostly that time of his life was centered around chanting. And specifically from the age of 24 onward to the age 42. Of course, he also followed the Yuga Dharma in the last part, but that was more in an internal mood and not so much with his devotees in, 
ecstatic kirtan. Yeah, there was also some ecstatic kirtans, but they were much more rarer at the end. Mahaprabhu went in, into deep ecstasy. So Krishna, he's the highest form of enjoyment. <laughs> he enjoys on the highest level of expression of his own spiritual nature. When we connect with Krishna, we get a little taste of that enjoyment, how, how sweet it is. Um, just like when we chant Hare Krishna, how much happiness can we experience from that chanting? I mean, we get a lot of happiness. I see the devotees when they're out on Harinam, they look very happy. <laughs> they are happy, and other people are becoming happy hearing it. Seeing the, not only hearing the devotees, but just by seeing devotees, because when you see somebody happy, you become happy, unless you're a real demon. <laughs> That's another thing. <laughs> so, the, so uh, and there's a few demons around, like mostly 98%, but anyway. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so did you meet any demons today? <laughs> So yeah, so this chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra, the ecstasy we, we uh, can experience in that chanting is only a drop of what that and what is available through that chanting. The, the happiness you can get in devotional service from chanting is so strong that you will die from happiness, literally. You will leave your body because you're so happy. It's just... Can you imagine that? I mean, people desire die because they suffer so much. But you can die in another way. <laughs> and that's pretty good if you could get to that stage. <laughs> and then you know your destination is, is, is perfect. <laughs> but Krishna won't let you do that, so he'll let you get just happy enough where you can, you know, you know eventually come back to him in devotional service. Like that. So the Yuga Dharma, this chanting of the holy names of the Lord, is the special mercy of the Lord. And as it mentions, it's a side benefit. <laughs> the Lord gave that as an extra feature of his appearance, but it was necessary because in Kali Yuga, there's no other way to change the world. People cannot understand philosophy in this age, it's very difficult. They can read books, and usually they read books that are not so much about philosophy, they like stories. People like stories in this age. And it's any kind of stories that looks interesting or exciting or mysterious or condemned, <laughs> any kind of stories people like. But philosophy, even the Vedas, even, even highly intelligent people can't understand the Vedas. They're so difficult to understand. Even the even great scholars can't. So therefore, in this age, Lord Chaitanya didn't preach so much, but he mostly executed the purification of the world through two things: through chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra and through distributing of Krishna Prasadam. <laughs> These are the two things. Krishna Prashadam transforms your consciousness in such a way that you can be receptive to the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. If you take only Krishna Prashadam, your, your chanting will become more and more sweeter and ecstatic, happy. If you don't eat Krishna Prashadam and you eat something else, it will be hard to chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> So always try to eat Krishna prasadam. It's important because it's a purifying agent that creates the mind, a certain mindset, to open up the heart for chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare. And there's another feature. It's called dancing. <clears throat> dancing and Chanting, and Prabhupada says, you feel a little happy, you get up and you dance. <laughs> and then he said, but even if you don't feel happy, get up and dance and you will feel happy. <laughs> so usually people have to get intoxicated with some kind of substance before they can dance. But the devotees are intoxicated with a different kind of substance, one that is bursty, addicting. It can be, you can get an addiction from it but there's no coming down. 
and it's all it doesn't have any side reactions. <laughs> it, all the reactions are transcendental. So chant, dance, and then take Krishna prasadam. This is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's formula for purifying the world in this age. It's so simple and so nice. I can say for sure that this temple here is one of the more outstanding temples in the world that likes to emphasize kirtan, so that's good. You keep that mood going, and the more you increase it, the more you'll find that devotees will find happiness, and there'll be less and less problems. There will be more and more ways to... Uh, you'll be able to go deeper into the reading, because you'll see, when Prabhupada did programs for people in general, he didn't just speak. He had the devotees do kirtan. Because he knew even general, basic, simple philosophy was very difficult for people to understand. But if you do kirtan, then you speak after that, or you, sp you speak and then you do kirtan, that knowledge becomes stronger, what they receive, like that. I was speaking to to Uddhav Mitra just the other day, and he was telling me, because he's distributing books and people are hearing the, the kirtan at the same time, it's easier to give out the books. <laughs> they become more, what we say, uh, receptive to the knowledge when the sound of the kirtan is there. This is the power and efficacy of Krishna's holy name, a transformable like that. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, Kirtaniya Sadarahi. <laughs> I was listening to Prabhupada today. He was saying, Kirtaniya Sadarahi. He said, you may not be able to do it for 24 hours, but this is Lord Chaitanya's instruction anyway. <laughs> so he says, try to chant as much as you can like that. To limit ourselves to 16 rounds is just something we have to do and we must do because that actually that that is required for our purification. But one who understands and develops a little taste for chanting wants to chant more and more and more. And so you'll find, just like there was one story where one devotee was with Srila Prabhupada and Prabhupada had been talking about the chanting. And so the devotee said, Prabhupada, are you chanting all the time? Prabhupada said, yes. <laughs> now, what does that mean? He's also talking. He's also doing other things. So, and then Prabhupada said, come, put your ear on my back. So the boy put his ear on Prabhupada's back. And he could hear the mantra going on <laughs> inside. <laughs> so inside, a pure devotee, his heart is constantly chanting the holy name. It's going on. It's not. They don't leave that for even for you know 24 hours a day. That's a high level of bhakti. But it's possible. Sometimes you see we, when we have an ecstatic kirtan program here, and devotees chant all day. You go to sleep at night, and you're still chanting. You wake up in the next morning, the mantra is still with you, right? <laughs> so that's an example. Even without you trying, the mantra still resonates within the consciousness. So that's the stage we want to come to, where, where the holy name is always with us, and then that means Krishna is always with us. And if Krishna is always with us, then there's no nothing else that has any... can 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 uh, disturb us in any way when Krishna is always with us. All problems, just like one of my senior God brothers, he was telling me, he said, you know, people were coming to me with this problem and that problem and so many problems. And I was talking, so I was thinking, hmm, what can I do? Big Yatra, it was the Russian Yatra. So he was saying, what can I do? So, so he decided to make a plan. So he decided for one year, every class, he would speak about the chanting of the Holy Name. Every class. So he did that for one year. And then he told me, he said, 
After that one year, 50% of the problems were gone. <laughs> That's the problem. We don't chant enough. <laughs> That's our problem. <laughs> if we would chant more, we would re we realize that this is the, the only problem, is that we're not chanting enough or we're not connecting with Krishna in the most direct and most sweetest way through the holy name of the Lord. And even if the chanting is not so tasty, it will become tasty through the pro process of chanting more and more and more like that. So this is where Lord Chaitanya's mercy has reached its highest. He's made it so direct. And then dancing and then eating prasadam. Actually, should I tell you the actual process of Lord Chaitanya? Should I tell you? You don't want to hear it. <laughs> okay, he's a, he says, you have kirtan, and you chant, and you dance. You get a little tired from dancing, so you stop, and you eat a little prashad, not much, and then you again chant and dance. And then you get a little tired again, and you have a little more prashadam. And then you get up, and you chant and dance. And then you get a little tired again, and then some more prashad. In this way, this is your whole life, and you don't do anything else. It just keeps going. <laughs> so you think, how is that po It is possible. <laughs> if you eat too much prashadam, then it'll, be, it'll tire you. And if you eat too little, you may not have enough energy, so you have to get that right amount there. But So that's a program, if you want to start it. We can start it the day after Lord Chaitanya's appearance. <laughs> and everything will be nice. <laughs> Tonight, it works. It works. But we won't do it because we're thinking, you know, I got a lot of other things to do. <laughs> and if death comes along and says, time's up. Excuse me, but I got so many things to do. Sorry. <laughs> it's all over. <laughs> you can do them next life. <laughs> so we have to take time for this Yuga Dharma. Hare Nam Sankirtam. Hare Krishna. Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. Hare, Hare. Hare Ram. Hare Ram. Ram, Ram. Hare, Hare. Mm. So we'll conclude here. Is there any comments or questions? Yes, Sir Shabji. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Maharaj, for this wonderful lecture. I'm wondering if our relationship with the spiritual master is eternal. Some devotees say that it is, some devotees say that it's not. Well, it becomes eternal as soon as the connection is made. And then it and then it remains eternal from that point onward. Does it mean that the spiritual master cannot go back to the spiritual world unless un, until he saves all the disciples from yeah, the clutches? Yeah, Prabhupada said that also, because the contract at the time of initiation is that there is two agreements. The disciple agrees to follow the instructions of the spiritual master. And the the, the um, spiritual master agrees to take the disciple back to Godhead. So there's coming, the contract is from two sides. If the disciple breaks the contract, then the, the spiritual master will try to reinforce that vow within the disciple. But if he remains, uh, you know, defiant, doesn't follow, then... The spiritual master does not have to uh, keep his, because he, both parties have to keep their their vow. So Prabhupada said, yeah, spiritual master has to come back. But he comes back in another form, he doesn't come back in the same form. Just like uh, the story of Bilba Mangala Thakur, when Bilba Mangala Thakur was chasing the prostitute Chintamani, even at the time of the death of his father, that same night, after he did the last rites for his departed father, he went to see this prostitute, Chintamani. He was so attached to her. 
she was a high class prostitute and she had great opulence and she lived in a, a beautiful palace. So that night, he wanted to go see her, but it was a torrential rainstorm. It was pouring, and all of the uh, all of the dock, all of the boats that were needed to cross the river, because he had to cross the river to get to her place, were gone. There was nobody there. But he was so desperate to see Chintamani that he decided to swim across the river. And while he was swimming across the river, you know, it became difficult because of the rain. So there was a dead body floating in the river, and he grabbed onto that dead body just so he could somehow or other, you know, make it across. Finally, he came across. He was f fully wet, freezing from the rain and cold. He came to her, her uh, place, and she had locked the outside door, which was a, a compound with a wall on it, and it was a. So he couldn't get in, so he decided to climb the wall. <laughs> so he was climbing the wall, and when he was trying to climb up, he thought it was a vine he was going to climb, but it was actually a snake. So he, somehow he got freed from the snake. He came over the wall, and when he came over the wall, he fell. And then he's, he's like wet, tired, cold, freezing. And Chintamani comes, and she sees him. She said, oh, my God. And then she spoke something. She said, if you had that love for Krishna as you have that love for this body, your life would be perfect. It shocked him when he, she said that because it wasn't her voice. She was a medium for his spiritual master because in the previous uh, life he was Lila Sukha. And he lived in Vrindavan. And so his previous spiritual master was named Somagiri. Somagiri spoke through that prostitute just to awaken his disciple in that life. And he woke up because of that. And therefore he took his, and he gave up all everything and then he left and went to Vrindavan. And eventually he met Krishna. And there's some incidents on the way. But in, in the first verse of the Krishna Karnamrita, which was been by Bilba Magalar Thakur, he glorifies three personalities, Krishna, Somagiri, and Chintamani. Chintamani and Somagiri as his Shiksha and Diksha Guru, like that. So the spiritual master will come back in one form or another to save his disciple. But Prabhupada said, try to finish up in this life. Don't give your spiritual master any added trouble. <laughs> so, in other words, try to make it back. In other words, at least do your best to... Uh, perform devotional service. And even if you fall short of perfection, still if you try, then the spiritual master is pleased. But we should remain sincere, or sincere means that whatever vows we take on initiation should remain very strict throughout our whole life. Yeah, so yeah, that, it's true. It, it becomes eternal. At that, at the time of the initial connection. And how about in case when a disciple gets initiation from spiritual master, and spiritual master falls down afterwards, what's his relationship with the spiritual master? Is well, it eternal also? At the time of initiation, when the spiritual master was in good standing, that that person is still initiated. But then, in order for him to make further progress, he has to take shelter of the disciplic succession. So that means he has to take shelter of Srila Prabhupada's society and the teachings of Srila Prabhupada. He may get reinitiated or he may not. It's not a requirement. Sometimes people say that when your spiritual master falls down, you have to get reinitiated. That is not a scriptural injunction. It's an option because some people need it. But in principle, 
If you stay fixed in your Krishna consciousness, take shelter of the, the association of devotees, and follow Prabhupada's instructions, then you're initiated. Now, that relationship with that living entity who performed your initiation as your spiritual master is still there, but now you're connected to the disciplic succession. If that spiritual master in the next life comes back and again takes up pure devotional service and becomes again fixed, then that connection is again reestablished. It's still there, but it's not connected because of the qualifications are not there. <laughs> hmm. Guru Tattva is a very complex issue, <laughs> to say the least. Very complex. <laughs> Even today, there's still discussions on what is actual, the actual principles of Guru Tattva. Does that help? Yeah, okay, thank you. Anything else? Yes. yes. Uh, thank Shri you. Pancha Tattva Ki Jai. Shri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu Ki Jai. Shri Nityananda Ram Ki Jai. Shri Advaita Gadadhar, Shri Vasudhi Gaur, Bhaktivinoda Ki Jai. And thank you for the lecture, Maharaj. Um, you were uh, speaking about uh, how we get more taste for chanting, and chanting becomes easier when you, we are in the favorable uh, conditions, such as only taking prasadam. Um, and I would like to know uh, what can we do to help uh, keep up our chanting when we are put in not such favorable conditions. Thank you. You mean unfavorable conditions are, what, what's an example of that? Um, such as not having access to prasadam or a devotee association or oh, okay. uh, lectures, etc. Well, you, you have to eat something. <laughs> so you can use the prayers that are, you, we use for performing the uh, transformation of foodstuffs to prasadam, the, the, sig the three prayers chanted three times each. You know those prayers? Yeah. You can do that. Um, that's one way. And uh, spiritual life is not necessarily um, what we say, done in proximity. Spiritual life, the connection with the Lord, the connection with the pure devotee is done through the instructions. So if, you, if you're following the instructions of the Lord and his pure devotee, you're connected. But if we're not too strong, we don't feel that connection. When we're strong, we can feel that connection. So try to keep that association, but because of an emergency or some situation may arise, then through prayer, through, you know, making our offering of prasadam, we can stay connected. But then we always think, when can I get back into the association? <laughs> Which makes it much more nice and easier. Sadhu Sangha, Sadhu Sangha, Sarva Sastri Hoy, Lava Matta, Sadhu Sangha, Sarva Siddhi Hoy. <laughs> so the association of devotees makes everything perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Yes, question. Anyone else? I thought I saw another hand up. Okay. Donnie Lu. Hare Krishna. You have uh, such a nice name. I wonder, wonder, I wonder what your new name's going to be. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> uh, you have a plan to get one, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just checking. <laughs> uh, you mentioned that Prabhupada constantly chanting uh, Mahamantra, mm. and I'm wondering is this also is uh, like if we chant and we're not concentrated, focused on the Mahamantra, it is offensive. But if you're doing your japa, 
It is, but if you're just doing day-to-day -day work and you're, you know, say you're cooking or you're driving and you're chanting, that's extra. But still, to stay, to stay connected, we, we can do that. So we may not always be attentive. But the, the principle is, satatam kirtayantumam sadayan. Kirtaniya Sadarahi. So the chant 24 hours. But as Prabhupada said, 16 rounds on the beads, innumerable rounds off the beads. <laughs> so that means you can chant anytime, any place, anywhere. There's no rules and regulations. But when you're doing your prescribed rounds, then you should be in an atmosphere where you don't get deviated. And if your mind goes, then you always bring it back to the sound. That you have to do. Mm. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. So work on it. Uh, chanting is, a, is something we have to continue to work on. It's not like it becomes easy. It becomes easy at a certain stage, but... To get to that stage requires effort, <laughs> requires focus, requires determination, requires prayer. prayer. And these are all of the things that help bring us to the stage of continuous chanting, or what we say, attentive chanting. <laughs> if you can chant, say you chant 10 mantras attentively, that means you can chant 20 mantras attentively. If you can chant 20, you can do 40. If you can do 40, you can do 80. <laughs> so the fact that you can do some means you can always do more. <laughs> okay, so we stop here? Yeah, sure. Can you give him the microphone? Yes. I maybe need a further uh, explanation um, so, uh, let's say we are chanting on the bus, uh, like Japa chanting, and on the bus there are many distractions, like the announcements and people and music, I don't know. Uh, so, it, uh, would it be better if uh, we were not to chant Japa and only, um, uh, like, um, yeah, chant with no Japa? Uh, to not uh, uh, make offenses to the holy name. Well, if you can't do your regular rounds, if you everybody should have a, what they call a numerical vow, that everyone has made some vow. I'm going to chant 16 rounds every day. I'm going to chant, you know, 32 rounds every day. I'm going to chant 10 rounds every day. Whatever your vow is, that you can't do, and in any other atmosphere it has to be done in a place where you can fully concentrate. But if you're traveling on the bus, you can still chant. Because if you don't chant, what are you going to do? Listen to the music? <laughs> so, yeah, to help you not listen to the music, yeah, you can chant. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so that you, that you should do. Because the distractions of the, the material world are, are always going on. So we want to stay... And even if you're chanting, and somehow you can connect through the chanting, may not be regular, but at least you won't be, you know, you know, chanting, I can't get no satisfaction, <laughs> and I try, and I try, and I try, I can't get no satisfaction. <laughs> no satisfaction. <laughs> So you don't want to chant that because you can get satisfaction. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Hare Krishna. <laughs> okay, thank you. Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Sri Harinam Sankirtan ki jai. And just just basic announcement tomorrow is the Ikarasi Vrata. Mm -hmm.